Welcome everyone to tonight's program. My name is Alexandra O'Neill and I'm the membership and event manager for the Wolfsonian FIU. Tonight I'm joined by David Rifkine. David Rifkine is an associate professor in the Department of Architecture at Florida International University, where he teaches courses in architectural history, theory, and design. He is also a faculty fellow in the, in the Wolfsonian Public Humanities Lab. His current research deals with urbanism and architecture in Ethiopia and Eritrea from the late 19th century to the present. He is the author of The Battle for Modernism, Quadrante and the politi Politicalization of Architectural Discourse in Fascist Italy, and has published articles on architecture and urbanism in Italy and Ethiopia, and curated the 2012 exhibition Metropole Colony, Africa and Italy at the Frost Museum. In um, and the 2016 exhibition Contemporary Architecture in Ethiopia at the Miami Center for Architecture and Design. He co-edited A Critical History of Contemporary Architecture with Ellie Haddad. David also holds a degree from the Boston Architectural Center and Columbia University. Welcome. Um, Thank you so much for joining us, David. Oh, thank you, Alexandra. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so I'm just gonna do a little brief intro for tonight's program and then I'll let you get started. Um, <clears throat> the 1930s battle over East Africa is at the heart of this evening's talk. When Mussolini invaded Ethiopia to expand the Italian empire, artists and writers played an important role in building support for colonization through material culture. Tonight, David's going to take us through the collection of objects that attempted to reinforce a new image of Italian East Africa and extend Italy's power and influence during the war. David, take it away. Thank you again for the invitation. And I just want to mention at the, the beginning that this um, research all comes out of work that I've done both here at the Wolfsonian and then also uh, abroad in various archives. But I wanted to say that the Wolfsonian is really important to my work. And actually, it's the Wolfsonian collections that are one of the major reasons why I chose to come to FIU uh, 13 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and the story that I want to tell is one of how imperialism and colonialism became part of the everyday life for Italians who were living under fascism. Most people in Italy never went to Africa, and so they never got to see the, um, the colonies firsthand. But the colonies were a part of their everyday life. They came into their homes. Most people, in fact, had at some point some piece of paraphernalia or memorabilia that either came from the colonies or was directly related to the process of colonization. And this was for a number of reasons, largely because the invasion of Ethiopia had more to do with Mussolini's government trying to create consensus for their rule at home in Italy than it ever had to do with anything to do with Ethiopia. But I just wanted to give you a taste of what it was like inside the homes of everyday Italians during the 1930s. So this young woman here um, in uh, Naples has a map of Ethiopia uh, and all of uh, East Africa on the wall of her home in Naples. And I'll come back to this in a moment and show you uh, why it's important. But first I wanna just um, situate you in case you're unfamiliar with the geography of North Africa and East Africa. Um, this is another image that comes from one of the books in the Wolfsonian collections. Um, it shows uh, the same terrain in two different years. On the left is right after the First World War when the Italian colonies in Africa included the, um, the old uh, Ottoman uh, provinces of Tripolitania and Chirinaica which were later fused together by the Italians to create modern Libya. And then on the Red Sea coast is the country of Eritrea, which was an Italian colony from the late 19th century. And then on the Indian Ocean coast, um, or the, the coast of the Arabian Sea is Somalia, or at least the, the half of Somalia that uh, Italy controlled from the late 19th century on. And then the image on the right shows um, Libya, now a consolidated territory, a proper colony as part of Italy's empire. And um, to the, uh, in the Horn of Africa, you see Eritrea and Somalia joined by Ethiopia, which was understood as the crown jewel in the Italian empire. The interesting thing is, as I mentioned, most Italians never got to Africa. And so they never got to see these places firsthand. 
what they knew was what they saw in state propaganda. And so, for example, they would see images like this. This is um, the town center in an agricultural colony in, uh, in Libya. And it's the image of this kind of an extraordinary thing. It's this perfect, clean, almost utopian-like settlement in the middle of what seems to be a vast and uninhabited landscape. And this, of course, is illusory. The Italians never planted any crops in places that weren't already being cultivated in Libya or Ethiopia or Eritrea. I mean, fertile ground is fertile ground. And of course, people had been plowing these fields. In the case of Ethiopia, they'd been plowing these fields for 5,000 years. But the Italian propaganda always made it look like they were creating something out of nothing, creating this um, fantastic utopian settlement. And the architecture that is presented in these photographs is fascinating because it's an architecture that is really designed to be consumed through images. In the case of the great marble arch in Libya, this is a building that most people would never visit, especially since it was built in a very, very, very sparsely populated part of Libya. It's on the coast of the Mediterranean, about halfway between Tripoli and Benghazi. So it's right at the border of the old provinces of Tripolitania and Cyrenaica. And when the Italians brought these two uh, provinces together to create the modern colony of Libya, which gave the modern nation of Libya its uh, borders, they built this arch to celebrate that fact. And what's interesting about it too is that it wasn't just built for, con you know, for consumption at home through images, but it's also a rehearsal of things that the Romans had done. And this was something that the, uh, the, the fascist um, government was really conscious of. It was the idea of justifying the colonization of Africa in terms of rehearsing the colonization of Africa by the Roman Empire. In other words, people today in Italy or in Italy of the 1930s um, could see themselves as being the inheritors of the Roman Empire. So just as the Romans had um, colonized all of North Africa, including Cleopatra's Egypt, here modern Italians were colonizing places like Libya and eventually Ethiopia. And so whenever the Italians built roads, or built bridges, they were being very conscious of the fact that they were um, expanding a network of roads like their uh, Roman forebears had done. And so especially bridges were always um, inaugurated with religious ceremonies. And here you see the inauguration of a bridge um, that has a, a priest making an offering. Um, so there's a kind of an interesting kind of um, uh, coalescing of the sacred and the secular together in this um, colonial enterprise. The roads that were built all over Ethiopia were extraordinary feats, right? These are largely built by hand across very forbidding terrain. Ethiopia is largely mountainous. Um, it's uh, the Ethiopian highlands are mostly 7,000 feet up in the air and very mountainous. It's the result of volcanic activity from millions of years ago. So building roads there was quite a feat, or at least it was presented that way by the Italian authorities who would even have um, books uh, filled with images like this. This is a, a book that's in the, um, the Wolfsonian collection that documents the construction of the road from Asmara to um, Addis Ababa. So Asmara is the capital of Eritrea, and this is the road that was built to Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia. And it followed the route of the Italian army as they marched from Eritrea to uh, Ethiopia, to the heart of Ethiopia. And I find it absolutely fascinating how important it was for the Italians that everyday Italians were invested in this project of colonialism and imperialism. And so um, there were games like this that would be um, on the shelf of every Italian family so that kids could start to learn the flora and the fauna of the Horn of Africa. They could place this in different parts of the country and learn about um, these colonial holdings. And it was a way of legitimizing the whole uh, process of conquering this uh, land because the, the conquest of Ethiopia was a very expensive project, both in terms of treasure and lives. And so this brings us back to this young woman um, putting pins in a map on the wall of her family's living room in Naples. Why is she doing this? Well, from 1935, from October of 1935 to May of 1936, Italian families all over the country did this. They followed the daily reports of the advances of the Italian army uh, as they moved from uh, um, Eritrea and Somalia toward the center of Ethiopia, toward Addis Ababa. Uh, 
And so the invasion starts in October of 1935 after the rainy season has ended. And it continues until May of 1936 when Italian troops finally enter the capital and Mussolini proclaims a new empire. So this young woman is following that every day dutifully putting a pin in the map to show where the army is. And she knows about their advances, both because she's reading about it in the daily newspaper and she's hearing about it on the radio. And so these radios were also a really important part of the whole um, fascist propaganda project. Um, upper middle class uh, families could afford um, radios like this one, which we have in the collection at the Wolfsonian, of course. But in other places, like in um, workers' settlements in cities or in the villages that were built outside the major cities, often the Italian government would uh, uh, give the community a single radio, a large one, that people would listen to collectively at least once a week. And they would listen to these radio programs. And we have some of the posters that were put up all over town to advertise these weekly radio programs. And these radio programs would talk about the movement of troops across the country. Later, they would talk about things as you know, fascinating as the, the flora and the fauna of the countries or the, um, the, the civilizations that had once inhabited these places. Uh, in this case, this is one of these radio voyages. Radio voyage is a made up word, but it's a radio voyage of the empire about the reclamation of land, so land reclamation projects, but also the reclamation of people. Because one of the other ways that the invasion of Ethiopia was sold to the public was that this was a way of bringing civilization to people who lacked it, and also a way of helping Italians who were unemployed, uh, demobilized veterans to find um, proper employment as um, uh, either as agricultural workers like farmers or as industrial workers in these colonized countries. And when they listened to these radio programs, the thing that really stood out was the voice of Mussolini himself. And Mussolini is famous. I think we all know him as this great orator. Um, great in the sense that he was really famous for shouting at people and he had that really famous cadence and voice. So everybody in Italy knew his voice. They knew the cadence of his speech. They knew his rhetorical flourishes. And this was not true of previous leaders of the country. The previous um, uh, prime ministers of Italy, most people didn't know what their voices sound like. Most people didn't care. They certainly didn't know what the king's voice sounded like in Italy. But Mussolini used this new technology of radio as a way of reaching the masses and of developing a uh, consensus um, behind his rule at home and his military conquests overseas. He also used film very effectively. And in the case of images like this, this is a fantastic fold out um, photograph that we have again in the Wilsonian collections. It's an image of Mussolini, he's over there on the left, standing at his balcony in the Palazzo Venezia in Rome. And he's speaking to this oceanic crowd of people who are filling the Piazza Venezia in the heart of Rome. There's several hundred thousand people there and you can see them spilling out into the adjoining streets. They're going as far as you can see. And way off in the distance, I just wanna point out, there's the, um, the Colosseum off in the distance to the right. And you can see people going all the way up the road toward the Colosseum. And this is Mussolini commanding a crowd from his balcony. But what's more is he would command that crowd across his empire by having his voice broadcast over radio. And so images like this would be um, uh, would show up in popular magazines and newspapers and then later in books. This is the image of a, uh, um, a group of Italian colonists in Tripoli. Uh, in the capital of uh, Libya. And they're standing right at the point where the old city meets the new colonial city. And they're standing, importantly, right outside the, the walls of the old castle. So as they're listening to Mussolini's voice being broadcast on the radio and listening to local speakers speaking from the ramparts of the castle, they're all facing the castle as if they're ready to storm its walls all over again, like they believe that their army had done once. And every time the Italians entered a new city in the sort of this march toward creating an empire, they would rehearse the same kind of event somewhere else. Here inside the Imperial Gebi, or the Imperial Palace Complex in Addis Ababa, you see another one of these, um, uh, these sort of adunate or um, uh, large uh, gatherings uh, where um, the crowd below would listen to a speaker above. And very often there would also be a loudspeaker set up 
so that they could listen to the voice of Mussolini being broadcast from Rome. Here's another scene from Addis Ababa. This is from the Piazza district, which is the, uh, the commercial um, heart of Addis Ababa on the left and the Mercato, which is the commercial um, sort of the, the, the working class commercial area on the right. And in both cases, you have crowds listening to the Viceroy Teruzzi speaking on behalf of Mussolini. So he's standing at, on balconies in both locations, yelling at the crowd the way that Mussolini would stand on his balcony and yell at the crowd. And every Italian city had a space that was designed for this. New cities like Sabaudia, which is the crown jewel of new ur urban developments in the areas south of Rome, um, Sabaudia had these piazzas that were designed for crowds to gather and listen to somebody, either Mussolini or somebody speaking on his behalf, um, address the crowds from a balcony. This is the inauguration of Sabaudia in 1934, where the king, Victor Emmanuel III, is speaking from a balcony underneath that tower in the middle of the image, and he's speaking to this crowd of people assembled below. So Italian cities would have spaces like this designed just for these events. And really important buildings like the Casa del Fascio or the local fascist party headquarters would always have these balconies that it was that spatial relationship between balcony and piazza or between speaking platform and space of gathering. That was the spatial relationship that always spoke about this hierarchical relationship between the people and their uh, very hierarchical leadership um, culminating in the dictator at the top of the pyramid. So What's interesting about spaces like this, this is in the northern city of Como on the shores of Lake Como, north of Milan. The people standing on the balcony there um, addressing this crowd stand in for Mussolini ordinarily. But even when this piazza is empty and there's nobody on the balconies, anybody who had been alive at this time in the city would remember this event. This piazza, even when it was empty, it would reverberate with the memory of those moments. And in this case, that group of people that are standing in the foreground might notice that they're not pointed toward the building. They're not pointed at the balconies. Instead, they're pointed toward the flagpole just to the left. And on the flagpole is a loudspeaker from which they're listening to Mussolini being broadcast live from Rome, declaring uh, that Addis Ababa has fallen and that Italy now has an empire again, like the Roman Empire 2000 years earlier. And so throughout this whole process of colonization and then eventually the construction of an empire. One of the things that the Italians were very concerned with was something that all of the European colonial powers referred to as the civilizing mission of colonialism. It was the idea that places that were being uh, occupied by these European forces were somehow less civilized than the Europeans. And therefore this gift that the Europeans would bring of civilization was somehow something that would justify the whole process of conquering this country. And of course this is, nonsense. I mean, the people of Ethiopia had developed agriculture and urbanism and even written language before the Romans had, right? But it was always part of the propaganda of a country like the Italians to claim that they were bringing civilization. And therefore, you always see these images of modern technology, like the telephone and telegraph wires on the left, or the self-propelled um, train on the right, and you always see them in a landscape that is otherwise denuded of any kind of signs of civilization. There's no buildings, there's no clear agriculture or anything. It's as if the Italians are bringing civilization to a, a land that's not even occupied or not even inhabited. And we'll point out too one cool thing about the image on the right, that train is a Litorina. It's a self-propelled diesel train produced by Fiat. And it, uh, we have one in the Wolfsonian collection. I believe it's the largest object in the Wolfsonian collection. Uh, and it's now on display in, um, in uh, Turkey. But let's get back to this whole process of putting pins in the wall in our living room in Naples. So this young woman um, who's uh, putting the pins in the map on the wall of her parents' uh, living room, she's not alone. And there are maps like this all over Italy. Um, and one of the really fun things about um, looking through the material from this period is to see just how enthusiastic different companies were about selling the idea of having a little version of this, say, in your office. 
This is a, um, a large mural that would be assembled from pieces of colored linoleum that you could put on the wall of your office if you were so inclined and you wanted to have a map of the empire in your office. It was produced by the linoleum company and the journal that it's being reproduced in, Edilizia Moderna, just means uh, modern building. But this magazine, which was a glossy mag magazine that you could easily uh, mistake for being like Domus or Casabella. It was actually a ma magazine produced by the linoleum company. Uh, and it would have images like this, these images that were enthusiastic embraces of the project of colonialism on the part of, you know, a company that basically makes floor coverings. And one of the things that that points out is that the everyday process of supporting colonization and the construction of an empire was not just something that was spread by the government in Rome, but it was also something that was embraced by companies, companies like Fiat and Pirelli and all the other companies that we think of today associated with Italy, uh, Caproni and so on. It was a project that everybody understood that they could both um, find some reason to support either by virtue of patriotism or by virtue of uh, profit motive. And this writing of the empire on the walls was something that people were familiar with all over the place. This is a, um, a children's youth um, athletic facility in um, the Trastevere neighborhood of Rome. It's a workers district in Rome. And here in this building, it's, um, whose construction starts before the invasion of Ethiopia, but it's completed right after, there is in the entry this extraordinary um, bas-relief uh, of a map of Africa showing the colonies of Libya and Ethiopia and carved into the into this uh, limestone on either side of the map are the names of different cities in um, uh, Ethiopia and Eritrea and the days uh, that they were um, first occupied by the Italian army as it marched its way toward Addis Ababa. And you would see this when you went to go use the gym. Um, so this, this is an image of a building that has, a, it's got a fantastic pool in it and a really nice gym and all those kinds of facilities. But then you would go home and with your younger brother and sister, you could play this game, the conquest of Abyssinia, which was a board game that came folded up inside a, a tin of um, cream of wheat, uh, essentially. And so we have these kinds of extraordinary things in the collection at the Wolfsonian. They document how the process of colonization and creating an empire was brought into the everyday homes of Italians. Also gets to the importance of food in the whole colonial enterprise, because one way that the Mussolini government sold this very expensive project of invading Ethiopia was that they claimed that just like Egypt had once been the breadbasket of uh, the Roman Empire, so too Ethiopia would be an important part of providing uh, food for, um, for the empire. And in the case of, um, this is actually about Somalia, these images, but when the Italians um, began building their colony in Somalia for the first time, they had access to a very tropical uh, environment and they started growing bananas. But because bananas were not a common part of the Italian diet in the 1930s, people needed to be shown, well, how do you eat a banana? How do you even peel a banana? And so the uh, banana monopoly, which was a state organization, the banana monopoly would set up kiosks all over the country in major cities, giving away free bananas, showing people how to eat them. And there are these really chilling images in their biannual report of uh, the image on the left, especially of these children giving the fascist salute while standing next to a basket full of bananas. And what it gets at too is that there was something about eating things that came from the colonies, eating and drinking things from the colonies that was raised almost to the level of taking communion. So if communion involves eating and drinking as a way of connecting you to your religious tradition through this ritual process of consuming food and liquid, well, so too could eating bananas or drinking Ethiopian coffee be associated with um, being a part of this colonial enterprise.
And we have um, some really fantastic uh, things like this also in the collection. These are not everyday plates that uh, ordinary people would own. These are kind of special collector's items, but they were plates that were produced by the Italians during the 1920s and 30s that are related to things like the process of becoming self-sufficient in the production of wheat um, or overcoming the sanctions that were imposed by the League of Nations in response to the aggression against uh, Ethiopia and so on. But this whole idea that the um, invasion of Ethiopia could produce um, some kind of a bounty of food that would be uh, beneficial to everyone back in Italy was a common trope that you would see re repeated over and over again in state propaganda. Images like this of um, uh, very um, happily compliant Ethiopians um, with arms full of uh, produce, images like this would show up in newspapers, popular magazines, and eventually in um, books like this, which were the annual, uh, sorry, the, uh, quad, uh, the quarterly reports of the colonial authorities. Another place too where children show up is in a really weird form of propaganda imagery. We have at the Wilsonian these postcards. We're not sure exactly who produced them uh, or who designed the postcards, but they use children to enact this kind of myth of the civilizing mission of colonialism. So some of the images will show you things like this of these benevolent Italian authorities um, feeding uh, Ethiopians who couldn't um, feed themselves, which of course, again, is you know mythic, right? It, it was actually the opposite, that very often the Italian farmers in Ethiopia were unable to successfully grow food, mostly because they weren't farmers by training. They were, you know, they were truck mechanics who were pressed into service as colonists. So instead, it was usually the opposite. It would be the other way around, that it was usually um, Italian colonists relying on their Ethiopian neighbors for their benevolence. But here you have this idea of the civilizing mission, the benevolence of the Italians bringing food and it's worth pointing out too the gender roles that are represented by the two Italians in this image. And there's other images too that show um, the emancipation of uh, slaves in Abyssinia and other events like this too. But they all come back to this idea that um, Ethiopians would gladly accept the rule of the Italians as a way of uh, placating any concerns about um, uh, about the domination of um, foreign people by uh, the Italian occupiers. And the last thing that I want to point out too was how the transformation of Italian cities in Italy paralleled the construction of colonial cities in the colonies and how most people started to understand this relationship through printed uh, documents, um, uh, through pr uh, propaganda or through the newsreels that were also shown uh, regularly, you know, before every movie um, by the Italians. So for example, these are side-by-side um, -side images of um, the construction of a new road in the heart of Rome on the left, and one of the master plans for the redevelopment of Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia, on the right. And what's interesting about them is not just that they're rendered in such similar terms, but that it was understood by the people who were looking at these images that the reconstruction of the capital in Italy and the reconstruction of the capital of the empire in Ethiopia were parallel processes that would happen simultaneously. And this was another way of connecting people in their everyday lives to this distant empire. So again, people who would most likely never see Ethiopia with their own eyes, would understand that as they were walking the streets of the capital in Rome, or walking in major metropolitan areas all over the country, that what they were doing was also walking streets that had some kind of an uncanny other um, in the empire. That it, walking through Rome was akin to being connected to the cities that were being built all over the empire, and particularly the reconstruction of Addis Ababa. And one way that I've started to decode this as a scholar is by looking at some of the things that we have in the Wolfsonian collection that are actually quite enigmatic. So we have these um, paintings. Um, they're about the size of a, well, they're larger than a sheet of note paper, but they're not terribly large, these um, paintings. We're not sure why they were produced. They may have been studies for a calendar, for example. We certainly don't know who made them. Well, one of the things that you get from this that's really fascinating is the similarity in each of them that there's 
a very identifiable airplane in flight over a very identifiable building. These are five, in fact, we can recognize not just five cities below these buildings, but actually five republics or empires that are represented by these cities. But I'm getting ahead of myself. What I wanted to mention too was that, again, most Italians had never flown in airplanes in the 1930s and probably never would, but they were certainly very used to the idea of seeing images of airplanes in flight. And one of the things that that did was it sort of, it implied this idea of modern advanced Italian um, technology in flight over these ancient cities as a way of symbolizing Italian dominion over foreign lands. And in this case, the flight of an airplane, a very recognizable Italian airplane in flight over the palace complex in the heart of Addis Ababa was a way of representing uh, Italian control over Ethiopia. You would see this image though used in all kinds of places. And one place you would see this is in the posters and the pamphlets that were all over Italian cities in the 1930s that were ways of advertising the tourist infrastructure of Ethiopia. Now, most people would never go to Ethiopia on holiday. I mean, it would be like visiting a war zone, but there was a lot of this imagery that was produced of, again, Italian planes in flight over uh, people representing somehow the compliant natives who had accepted Italian dominion over their countries. Uh, and these were used in the brochures of companies like Alla Littoria, which was the state airline company that preceded Alitalia. And so always, again, that image of the Italian plane in flight over something representing um, these conquered countries. So just as the Italian military planes had flown over the country as part of the conquest of the country, now those same, the civilian versions of those planes were being used um, as part of the tourist infrastructure. And so you could potentially go to Ethiopia on holiday and follow the same path that your valiant ancestors had followed when they were part of the great conquest of the Horn of Africa. At least that was what was implied. And so we always see these images, I mean, throughout the uh, propaganda of the period of Italian planes, first uh, military planes and then civilian planes in flight over Ethiopian cities, often uh, showing very recognizable or iconically recognizable parts of those cities, like here, the, um, the Piazza district, the heart of um, Addis Ababa, and that brings us back to these images. And so I'll show you just two of these uh, paintings. So on the left is a uh, Savoia Marchetti 73 in flight over um, the Colosseum. And the Colosseum is obviously an iconic representation of Rome. We all recognize it. You don't need to see the rest of Rome to know that this is the Colosseum. It's not just any amphitheater, it's the Colosseum in Rome. And on the right is the Church of St. George, the Cathedral of St. George in the heart of Addis Ababa. Again, underneath a, um, a Savoia Marchetti plane in flight over it. And so in uh, both of these cases, we're seeing not just an entire city like Rome or Addis Ababa being represented by a single iconic building, but we're seeing an entire empire represented by a single building. On the left, the Colosseum is associated with the Roman Empire. On the right, the Cathedral of St. George is associated with the Abyssinian Empire. And so we're seeing the use of a single historic structure being used to stand in for an entire ancient empire. The two planes are meant to stand in for the modern fascist empire. And this shows up in Italian urban planning from the period in the use of, again, these really iconic buildings in some kind of spatial relationship with new buildings or public spaces. Um, in the left, you see the Colosseum with that broad boulevard leading to it. And that boulevard connects the Colosseum with the Piazza Venezia, that great space that um, crowds would assemble in to listen to Mussolini. In fact, this boulevard that you see on the left aligns directly with Mussolini's balcony. You can see his balcony, that slightly faint, Im uh, faint um, thing on the dark facade of the Palazzo Venezia in the distance. And this is not by accident. That street, the Via del Impero, which we, today we call the Via dei Fori Imperiale, that street, um, when you walk on it, if you've been to Rome, you just assume it's been there since the time of Trajan or Augustus, but it's not. It was um, built in the 1920s, completed in 1932, and it was built to specifically link Mussolini's headquarters at the Palazzo Venezia with the Colosseum. And in so doing, it creates a spatial relationship between a building representing the empire of Augustus and Hadrian and a building representing the new empire of Mussolini. 
And whenever there were events like parades that would um, take place on this road, these um, parades would always start at the old building at the Colosseum, and they would end at the new building, in this case, the Palazzo Venezia. It was a way of, in these events, um, participating ritually in some kind of civic event that was meant to reinforce the idea that this spatial relationship that's created by this boulevard meant a transfer of power from the old empire to the new empire, in this case from the Roman Empire to this new modern Italian fascist empire. And in the case of Ethiopia, Ethiopian cities are redesigned this way too. This is the city of Gondar uh, in the north, um, uh, close, close to Lake Tana, the, at the headwaters of the Blue Nile. And in the distance, that building with the crenellation, the uh, fortifications in the distance, it's a castle that was built um, uh, in the 17th century. The two buildings in the foreground were built by the Italian uh, authorities in 1936, 1937. And you'll notice a parade here, these parades that would happen throughout the year. Again, they always started at the old building and arrived at the new buildings as if they were affecting some symbolic transfer of power from the old empire to the new empire. And in this case, it's from the Abyssinian empire to the Roman or to the new uh, Italian fascist empire. And so this transformation of cities happened over and over again, both in Rome and in Ethiopia. And one place where they came together, where they merged was again here in Rome. The image on the left I showed you before, that's the Colosseum. And just to the right of it is the Arch of Constantine, the triumphal arch that was built by the emperor who brought Christianity to the empire. Well, on the image on the right shows a new road that's built connecting the Colosseum to uh, essentially to the Aventine Hill. And that broad boulevard that is framed inside the Arch of Constantine, that boulevard terminates at this new modern building that was the headquarters of the, um, the Ministry of Italian Africa, uh, basically the ministry that would administer all of um, the Italian colonies in Africa. And standing in front of it, right at that street corner, that tall vertical element, is the stele that was taken from Aksum in northern Ethiopia and brought to Rome. This is a stele that was, at this point, about maybe 1,700 years old. And it was brought to Rome in a process that was meant to rehearse what the Roman Empire had done, starting with Augustus, where they would take, um, in their case, obelisks from ancient Egypt bring them to Rome to represent Roman dominion over Egypt. In the case of this new fascist empire, the idea was to bring one of these um, stele, which are very much like an obelisk, a tall masonry object, bring them to Rome and erect them there to symbolize this new empire. And so these are some of the ways that we that we see the, the bringing of, um, oh, and I'll just, sorry, the thing I'm leaving out of this is that the company that transported the obelisk or the, the stele from Aksum to Rome, the Gondrand company was effectively like Greyhound. They were the company that ran the buses in, uh, in Ethiopia. And they would present the images of them very heroically transporting this monolithic ancient monument um, as a way of showing that they too were part of this process of um, conquering an empire. And that every time you their buses, even if you're just going you know, to visit your aunt and uncle, if you took one of the bus in a very distant way, That, the, that this grand process of crafting an empire became part of um, the everyday lives of Italians. And I'll just end with two images. One is of books that are laid out in, in this case, in the, uh, the library by Frank Luca. Um, th this is basically what my day job looks like, doing research at the Wolfsonian. And then one last image of some of these materials on display at the Frost Museum on FIU's campus where I had the wonderful opportunity to uh, curate an exhibition with John Mogul. Um, and so I just want to end this by thanking the Wilsonian staff who've been such an important part of my research efforts uh, over the last 12 years. So, grazie. Thank you, David. That was such a great journey. I really appreciate you um, taking the time to kind of go through just the whole journey of that war and the influence. Um, I would like to open up 
our the, our Q and A now. So if you have a question for David, um, please feel free to use the Q and A button below to ask a question. Um, I have to say, what was really striking for me was um, in the beginning how you were saying that you know imperialism and colonialism really became a part of everyday life for for Italians. Um, you know, kind of seeing the girl, you know, tracing the war like it was a game and then seeing a few few slides later that there actually was a game you know like so while there was all this war happening um you know there are kids at home literally playing the, playing the game yeah um also the postcards uh with the children kind of again engaging in you know this whole like colonial colonialization and war um kind of like there's innocence on both sides like you know we're here to show them because they don't know any better um and kind of really downgrading the horrors of of what was happening you know yes um yeah have- it's a very true they the propaganda tended to downplay uh the atrocities the use of poison gas um the the uh, massacres that were uh, used um, the conquest was really brutal, and the administration of, of Ethiopia was particularly brutal. Um, and the, what the propaganda tended to do was downplay that, because one of the things that they they were trying to do was show that the conquest had been perfectly successful. It was a really rapid march of their troops, yada yada, and that the and when they were done, everybody was happy um, and sort of supplicant in a way. And this was not the case, right? I mean, the, most of the country was never under Italian control. Um, and it was restive during the five years of the occupation uh, until the Italians were um, themselves defeated uh, in the early days of World War II. Mm-hmm. And and the Italians did break Geneva Conventions, if if I'm correct, right? Yeah, this was it was it was it was horrible. Um, the uh, well, horrible in a number of ways. Um, this was the one of the first big tests of the um, League of Nations uh, because um, Ethiopia was actually an original signatory. Uh, when they were one of the countries that created the, uh, the League of Nations. I should back up and say that Ethiopia was the only country outside of Liberia that had escaped um, European colonization um, before World War II. And as such, it was a, it had this really extraordinary um, kind of position as being symbolic of African resistance to European colonization. And the emperor, Haile Selassie, had some really strong modernizing uh, interests. Um, even though he kept the feudal state, he was still interested in a lot of modern things like creating a modern legislature and um, yeah, uh, currency and legal system and all these things. And he was really interested in um, uh, foreign relations. Uh, he was one of the original signatories to create the League of Nations. And then when the Italians uh, were ready to invade, when they were massing their troops in uh, Eritrea, and it was clear they were going to invade, he made this fantastic impassioned speech in Geneva, um, telling the other countries in the League of Nations that we had all said this from the get-go, an aggression against one country is an aggression against all of us. It's your turn to step up and protect us. And what was interesting was how, in particular, the British and the French were the major powers decided not to intervene and and kept the rest of the League of Nations from intervening in a meaningful way, mostly because intervening on behalf of Ethiopia would have um, undermined the British and French arguments for maintaining their own colonial holdings in Africa and around the world. And so this was part of, you know, as you say, there were a lot of things that happened there. And the use of poison gas was uh, absolutely atrocious. Yeah. We have uh, quite a few questions, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to the questions. Um, Michael wanted to ask, where did your interest in Italy um, come from? Originally, okay, so uh, it's a, it should be this great noble thing where like it came to me in a dream or something, it didn't. When I was a doctoral student at Columbia, I was, I've always been really interested in the way that the built environment talks about relationships of power, state power, commercial power, things like that. And as I was searching for um, a topic, I kind of stumbled onto Italian fascism and particularly modernism within Italian fascism. So that 
Casa del Fascio that I showed you in Como um, was one of the projects that I talk about in my dissertation and my first book. And it came about actually almost accidentally. Um, it was just recommended to me that I, both that I study a topic that hadn't been very widely studied, but also that I do it in a country that was relatively easy to travel to. Um, unlike, I mean, my original interest was in going to um, Siberia and I was talked out of that um, pretty convincingly. So that, that's basically where the Italian thing came from. And then my interest in Ethiopia came also from a, a, like a random conversation with a, a family member and in-law who was living in Addis Ababa and was telling me about all the Italian architecture there. And I realized that at that point that um, everything that I knew about the, the design of buildings and cities in, uh, in Ethiopia by the Italian colonial authorities, everything I knew was written about the projects that were designed for these places but not built, or so far as I knew. And what I realized was that there was very little literature written about what the Italians had built. And so my first trip to Ethiopia was to start looking at places like this, and it was astounding. I mean, in five short years, the Italians built entire cities in both Ethiopia and Eritrea. Um, and then I became more broadly fascinated by Ethiopia itself. It's an extraordinary country, and the whole process of Ethiopian modernization on their own terms, starting in about the 1880s, is utterly fascinating. And I'll just mention here, because we have a, a Wolfsonian audience, Addis Ababa and Miami are founded within just a couple of years of each other, both founded by women too, which is kind of extraordinary in the history of cities. Uh, and they, the processes of modernization um, in the modern uh, Ethiopian state has a lot of parallels with uh, the development of South Florida, for example. And so I've just uh, been writing about that really ever since. Interesting. Um, David asks if there is a catalog for the Frost exhibition and what the focus of that exhibition was. No, there's no catalog, unfortunately. The, um, it was called Metropole Colony, and it was about this relationship between Italy and the colonies in Africa using all materials from the Wolfsonian collection. So you can see some of the posters, those plates, um, some really extraordinary work, um, much of which is you know, a lot of which was collected personally by Mickey Wolfson uh, and others that are just, you know, part of the, the various collections. But no, there's no catalog, unfortunately. Uh, Frank, our chief librarian, said that he just cataloged a newly acquired Ethiopian game today. So he will email you a photo no. tomorrow. Oh, wow. Wow. Thank you, Frank. Oh, that's very cool. No, Frank is awesome. And for those of you who haven't met Frank, he is a national treasure. Um, the, this, the research that you've seen here could not have happened without him or Sylvia, um, or John, you know, anyway, thank you, Frank. Um, David asked, why did Italy choose Ethiopia and Eritrea to colonize? Oh, those are great questions. Eritrea, partly because they were still uncolonized and Ethiopia, sorry, Italy in, all right, so the country we call Italy really, um, is coalesced and created modern Italy in the 1860s. And um, as such, they, um, like the modern country of Germany, they're relatively late to become modern nations. And so their whole process of colonization um, is already lagging behind the British and the French who had been at it for centuries, the, uh, or the Dutch or the Portuguese, et cetera, et cetera. So the Italians are scrambling to catch up with the other uh, European countries. They want to be considered seriously as a first rank country. And one way you do that is by having colonies. And most of the world has already been colonized. And so Eritrea starts as a um, a very small colony. It's the first of the Italian colonies on the Red Sea coast. They eventually move inland um, to the small settlement of Asmara, which the Italians will expand dramatically in the 1930s. And I will tell you, Asmara is one of the world's most beautiful cities. It's really extraordinary. Um, largely built between 1935 and 1941. And it's just a, it's an extraordinary place. Um, a lot of similarities to Miami Beach, built in the exact same period, um, and with architecture that has some strong similarities. The difference being that Asmara, like much of Eritrea and Ethiopia, is built in highlands that are 7,000 feet um, up. They're not at the coast like Miami Beach. Anyway, I digress. Eritrea is settled first, and then Ethiopia, because it's still independent, 
is available. But the Italians had first invaded uh, Ethiopia in 1895 and 1896. And in 1896, the uh, Italian forces are defeated soundly at two battles, particularly at the Battle of Adwa. And the Battle of Adwa is this, it's such a monumental event because it represented the Ethiopians maintaining their independence. It's the only time that a sub-Saharan nation had fought off a, a European uh, colonial power. Um, and it, you know, the Italian government collapsed because of this. Um, it starts the legend of Ethiopia as this, um, basically it's like in the 1890s, um, there were African-Americans who talked about Ethiopia the, um, as this kind of mythic land, this ancestral land for all black peoples. And it represented a strong, independent, modern nation. So the Italians, because they had been so humiliated by that defeat, had always vowed to return to Ethiopia. And so one of Mussolini's rhetorical flourishes was avenging the, um, the, uh, the defeat at Adua. Um, and therefore demonstrating that fascism was preferable to the old liberal um, democratic order that had lost um, to this you know, puny African nation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's why uh, Ethiopia was so important uh, to the Italians. Michael asked, how did Ethiopia compare in development of Libya at that time? Oh, it's, that's interesting. Um, they, so they develop um, for different reasons. Um, part, what Libya does is that it gives the Italians a uh, strategic um, foothold in North Africa, uh, especially right next to um, Egypt, which already had oil fields close to the uh, Libyan frontier and, all, and next to uh, Tunisia. And, and basically what it allows the Italians to do is that between their naval bases um, in the Italian peninsula and Sicily and in Libya, it gives them the strategic control over the middle of the Mediterranean. And so Libya really has more to do with strategic location, whereas Ethiopia was understood as being a place of demographic colonization. It was the idea that you could move hundreds of thousands of unemployed or underemployed Italians to Ethiopia. They would build cities, they would farm the land, and they would create this great colony. The reason for that, by the way, the part of one of the many reasons for invading Ethiopia, in addition to feeding the Italian homeland, was to stem the emigration from Italy. Because as we know, just living in North America, Italians by the millions emigrated from Italy to the Western Hemisphere, to North America and to South America, um, beginning in the middle of the 19th century. And this was always seen as a problem for the Italians. What they wanted to do was stop people from going to Argentina and the United States and instead have them go to these uh, Italian colonies like Ethiopia. And so to, to a degree, there's demographic colonization of Libya, but Libya was really more about strategic control over the Mediterranean and Ethiopia was more about a number of things, including agricultural, um, agricultural and demographic colonization. Uh, Diana asked, uh, what was your most surprising use of propaganda in your research? Oh, well, first, hi, Diana. Um, and what is the most surprising thing? I think part of it was seeing how architecture could be used in printed form. Because I was used, I'm always, I've always been used to architecture and urbanism being used for political purposes, but always, I always understood these in terms of what happens when you physically experience these spaces, right? So like to stand in uh, the piazza in front of St. Peter's and listen to the Pope on his balcony, it's a relationship I understand as a physical relationship when you're in that space. What I didn't and what I didn't um, fully uh, appreciate until looking at the material from Ethiopia was how much these um, cities that were being built in the colonized countries were being built partly because of the way they could be represented in propaganda. So again, maybe 10,000 Italians would ever get to see the city of Gondar in Northern Ethiopia. But those images were reproduced in Italy where millions of people saw them. And so this is an architecture that's being designed um, for propagandistic purposes, not just to be experienced live, but to be experienced um, through representation in visual media. Uh, what role did Coptics play in all of this? Oh, that's also a great question. So Ethiopia is, um, 
uh, about 40 something percent of the population of Ethiopia are Orthodox Christians. And they are also the, um, the ruling elite. So the ruling elite in Addis Ababa um, were Amharic speaking um, Orthodox Christians. But there's also a very, very large uh, Sunni Muslim uh, minority uh, in Ethiopia, and particularly in the East, in Harar, but also all over the country and also in Addis Ababa. And for the most part, um, Ethiopia is, uh, it's a very peaceful place in terms of sectarian relationships. Um, but one thing that the Italians did was that they learned from the way that the French and the British in particular had exploited lingering resentments between ethnic groups and religious groups in order to help um, consolidate rule over all of them. And so, for example, Muslims did suffer some repression under Haile Selassie's government. And so they were given full emancipation by the Italian authorities. In fact, the Italians built over 50 new mosques in Ethiopia as a way of currying favor with um, the indigenous Muslim population. And with the Orthodox population, they didn't really need to do that. So um, because they already had you know, all the religious facilities they needed. So what they tended to do was um, put the clergy on their payroll as a way of, uh, again, sort of um, drawing consensus uh, of the governed through their religious leaders. But that was, but the other thing too, I should point out is that there were several really remarkable uprisings um, by uh, Ethiopian patriots and some of the reprisals were taken out against clergy. So there were several massacres of um, Orthodox clergy that were undertaken by the Italian authorities. Interesting. Well, David, I just have to, again, thank you for taking the time to, you know, kind of go through this plethora of information and war and objects and just everything that you shared with us tonight was just so interesting. Um, and I think it's just been an absolute pleasure. Um, despite, you know, that the topic is not like the lightest of topics, but um, just seeing, you know, the power of, of radio, you know, and, and Mussolini, um, you know, everyone kind of coming together in these large spaces, you know, I, I thought that was fascinating. I, I thought every, every aspect was extremely interesting and I, I really appreciate you taking the time tonight um, to join us. Thank you. And again, thank you for the invitation. I really love being able to share this with my Wolfsonian family. Yeah, it's our pleasure. Um, so I wanna thank David for joining us tonight as well as all of our members for attending tonight's program. Um, if you'd like to stay in touch with Wolfsonian, please subscribe to our newsletter. Um, also, it's the holiday season, so if you'd like to share the gift of art to your friends or loved ones, please consider gifting a Wolfsonian membership this holiday season. Um, we also have holiday shopping discounts in our design store. Um, so for members, it's double discounts, so 20% off of our items. Um, we are open Thursday through Sunday, uh, so we encourage you to participate and shop. Um, so we encourage everyone to have a great holiday and we will see you in January. Good night. Hi everyone.